Well, hello, welcome again to Cure America. I'm Star Parker. And it's Washington has been frozen in debate about whether to pass massive new economic stimulus legislation. Something really interesting has happened in the real world. In the real world, Americans sent a message that they can take care of themselves just fine, thank you, politicians. The report came in from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the month of August that the U.S. economy is surging forward in a strong economic mode. The economy created 1.4 million new jobs, and an unemployment rate dropped to 8.4%. Not pretty compared to the 3.5 percent where we stood last February before COVID-19 hit, but compared to the 14.7 percent unemployment where we were in April, this is a remarkable and massive recovery. Just six months ago, when our nation, as many nations around the world, shut down their entire economies to get in front of the COVID-19 pandemic, the economic uncertainty had many in panic, despair. And while although most churches were closed, lots more than of late were on their knees. This labor report is also remarkable, given where things stood during the attempted recovery from our last recession, which began in 2008 through 2009. Then it took more than three years to get unemployment below 8 percent. So now the economic news of August 2020 is exhilarating. It points to a resilience within the American people that can only be attributed to the blessings of God mixed with an economic system that rewards elasticity. One would think that this enormous economic bounce back would be headlined across the country with celebrations of flags waving and fireworks. But for sure, what is great news for normal people is taken as bad news by politicians on the left who want government to own and operate all our systems of production and distribution. It's becoming clear every day that embedded in the philosophy of the progressive left is an insistence that individuals should not be allowed to manage their own lives through an economic system of capitalism. Actually, it's becoming clearer every day that progressives believe an economic system of socialism would be more equitable for our diverse society, so they attempt to further different aspects of their philosophy upon every chance, every crisis. And in fact, we can recall the sentiments uh, captured in the often quoted observation of Rahm Emanuel. Remember, most recently, he was the mayor of Chicago, and then he was the former chief of staff under President uh, Barack Obama. He said, you never let a serious crisis go to waste, quotes. He said, I mean, it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. Well, if anything, Emmanuel gets a high mark for honesty on that one. He was telling us that during times of stress, when many are afraid, those in politics who aspire the power to transform individualism into collectivism can use fear as a window of opportunity to move in and take over. So not only is very little celebration happening in progressive circles upon this good news from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but they're actually ignoring the news altogether. They are still pushing headlines of gloom and pessimism. So I thought we should think about a case for capitalism this week on Cure America. I again have some very interesting and special guests to weigh in on a few critical questions, like what should the folks whose businesses are still struggling be doing upon receiving this type of economic news from the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Or on the question of, is there any merit that America should consider socialism as an economic option to ensure stability throughout our population groups against the survival of the fittest advantages wrought through capitalism? What has happened in our society that far too many fellow citizens now believe that a biblical worldview of individualism and self-government is rooted in white privilege and is inherently racist or sexist? Yep, these are some interesting questions causing much concern and debate. So you will also hear from my distinguished panel to help us sort through the noise of the news to find some truth. And I'm excited to dive into this discussion with you right after this very important message. Hello, I'm Franklin Graham. Right now, we're in Alaska unloading a hospital for uh, COVID-19. But right now, our country is in trouble, and people are scared, people are afraid, and we see the violence and the injustices that are taking place. Only God can change this. Uh, this is a problem of the human heart, and we have sinned against God, and as a nation, we've turned our back on God. And I want you to know that God loves you, He cares for you, 
and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. And if we'll confess them and repent, turn from them and believe on his son, Jesus Christ, God will forgive us and he'll heal our hearts. If you have never invited Christ into your heart, pray this prayer with me right now to say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I want to trust him as my savior. I want to follow him as Lord from this day forward forever. Amen. Call that number right now that's on the screen. We've got someone who will pray with you, talk with you, and encourage you. God bless. Well, for those of you that have been watching on a regular basis, you know my special guest. You've seen him before, Mike Gonzalez, but this time I want you to get to know him a little better deeper on the subject at hand, the case for capitalism, because he has an amazing personal story. Uh, but Mike is a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and he's author of a new book. He autographed it for me. Thank you. A new <laughs> book, The Plot to Change America, How Identity Politics is Dividing the Land of the Free. Thanks for being here with us again. It's, it's entirely my pleasure. Thanks um, for having me. I, I, I tried to get you, and you were on vacation, and you said you went down to Maryland, got a lot of crap. I went to Deal, Maryland. It's a fantastic little place. Uh, we we grabbed it was a, it's a great it was a great summer for crabbing. So. Oh, was it? Yeah. I thought you were going to tell me. And I got a fish this big. No, in fact, I was no, asking no them fish. about Trump a bit yeah. more, and they said, "Don't you think he exaggerates?" I said, "I have a lot of friends who always catch fish this big." <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Mike, he spent close to 20 years as a journalist, 15 of them reporting from Europe, Asia, Latin America. He left journalism to join the administration of George W. Bush, uh, where he was a speechwriter for Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Chris Cox, who happens to be. From California, so yeah. I know him. Then you moved on to the State Department, it's a European Bureau, and you've written lots of speeches, lots of op eds, yeah. and very, very well respected and thought Thank of here in Washington. And I can't wait to get into your book, and then I'll have you back on uh, once I assess what you've said about how identity politics is dividing the land of the free. And you might bring some of that up because I'm going to also keep you on my panels. The reason I wanted you to be our special guest uh, for this segment um, is to get into your story. We are really in trouble as a country that people are taking seriously discussions about whether we should change our economic system to socialism. I think you know a little bit about that. I do. Um, you know, I was talking to my children about this and uh, about the fact that my father, I was born in Cuba, my father did not want to leave Cuba because he was a, a patriotic Cuban. And he thought, no, this is our country. And my mother was trying to always convince him that we had to go. And, and so I was telling my children, actually, I was, I was proud of him for being patriotic, but also uh, because I lived there for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Now, they, these were very difficult 12 years. I had, when people say, oh, you must have great memories. I say, well, I have strong memories, but they're all, almost all of them are bad. Mm. Uh, not, not with my family and so forth, and the beaches are beautiful, but the this, this system was extremely oppressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you're completely right that, um, and this is what I was saying to my children, the, exper the experiences I garnered in those first 12 years are se serving me really well here. Because one of the things, it's not just the economic system, which is completely messed up, and I'm very happy to talk about that, but it's the replacement of the culture. Okay. It's the replacement of the culture, how the, the, the rebels come in in 59, and they set out to destroy or, 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 or um, just uh, cast in a bad light everything that had come before them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the centuries of Cuban history, everything was rotten and corrupt, and only their narrative is good. Mm -hmm. And I see this, and, and of course, there's this a reason for that. Marxists do this, as I later found out when I studied and researched this matter. But what I see today in America, Star Parker, is the same thing, mm -hmm. is a group of dedicated, not by any means a majority, a minority, but a dedicated, active minority that is trying to replace the storyline of America, mm -hmm. which they call the hegemonic narrative, right. with a counter-narrative. Right. And that is a very worrisome thing. It should be a very wor worrisome thing to all Americans. Well, I think a lot of people in America believe that, yeah, but that's a different kind of country. They had a different kind of culture, and we can't be <laughs> overthrown. There are some things that are just so rooted uh, in our belief systems. So walk us through how, not just in Cuba, we've <laughs> seen it in other countries as well that there is an established culture, whether it had flaws or not, right. and then you can overhaul it and then end up in a very, very different 
scenario when it comes to even how people perceive their lives, the government's role in their lives, and their God, and all the other factors that play into a culture. You just touched on many things, and they're all true. Many people say that Havana, for example, is in ruins today because Castro and his communist cadre needed for the, the sign that there was a thriving culture before to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That these beautiful buildings, these beautiful uh, avenues and, and boulevards had to, had to uh, be allowed to crumble to, this is the, the, the physical manifestation of the destruction of the culture that existed before, beforehand. <coughs> uh, look, communism has existed has, has, has been imposed on many different peoples, not just in the, in the Caribbean, in the case of Cuba, but obviously in parts of Africa, mm -hmm. parts of Asia, parts of Europe. Um, we have been fortunate enough in the sense that we have completely laboratory experiments, right? We have in North Korea and South Korea, and we used to have a, a West Germany and an East Germany. Mm -hmm. And we saw West Germany thrive, be free, people were able to exercise their rights, and there was prosperity. It was one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. None of these things were true for East Germany. Right. And in the case of Korea, we have the case that after, since 1945, North Korea has been communist. The Republic of Korea, South Korea, has been, has been capitalist. Mm -hmm. For the last 30 or 40 years, it has also been politically free. As a result, the average South Korean today is, ex on average, six inches taller wow. than the average North Korean. Wow. And that is another physical manifestation of the, the penury that the system brings to everyone. So just watching that it, it vividly, and in fact, I've argued many times in a couple of my books that we also have that going on in our society to where you might have a capitalistic system for most of our healthier communities, our suburban communities, but in our urban core, in our hardest hit neighborhoods, right. we have socialism. <laughs> Government owns everything. It's part of distribution. So I'm assuming that you talk about some of these things uh, in your book because there is a plot to change America that we should be concerned about. I want you to touch on a minute. I'm going to keep you over for my panels of course. so that we can get into these things a little bit deeper. But tell me a little bit about uh, what your discoveries were. So the plot is uh, there are no, there's, there's no meetings in Brooklyn or Cambridge every Thursday night, but it is a plot in that there is a, a committed minority of activists and, and ideologues who do want to replace the American narrative. And, uh, they, they want to so I don't know how much time we have, but uh, they, they are disciples of an Italian communist called Antonio Gramsci, mm -hmm. who said the worker is not going to overthrow anything. Marx and Engels were wrong because the worker is too contented. The worker has bought into the culture and, and, and religion and economic system of his oppressors, quote unquote. Wow. And, and what we need to do is replace his thinking, mm -hmm. uh, his hegemonic narrative, with a counter narrative. And these can only be done through struggle sessions carried out by revolutionary vanguard. We see these wow. today. We are seeing We that see today. these that today. We that. see, so we're Robin D'Angelo and Ibram X. Kendi and all these uh, uh, so called anti racism training do is try to destroy the, 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 the norms and the, the narrative. Well, they've done that. We've seen it in a lot of places, and we'll talk about it a little bit more on the panel, to where the first thing we saw was religion being removed from the school, the Bible's right. being removed. Then right. we started seeing right. expansions of big government. The next thing we know, well, they're, they're indoctrinating our children, and we have two generations now that have bought this. We have to take those names down that you said, and we'll do a lot of research, and I'll get right back with you with my panel, and we'll discuss some more with Mike Gonzalez right after this in the message. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now to give you deep discounts, not just on my pillows, but also my mattress topper sheets and so much more. For example, you can get body pillows regularly $89.99, only $29.99 with your promo code. With our 60-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Sleep well, America! For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. I'm glad you're still with us. 
questions because I told you I have a very distinguished panel to discuss this case for capitalism. We're in some serious trouble as a country, and I'm glad to have my distinguished panel with me. I have Mike Gonzalez. Mike, you've met before, and uh, thank you. And Mike was wondered why he can't be on my rebel panel. And I told him he can't be on the rebel panel because I have two rebels. I have Richard Manning. Richard Manning is a <laughs> co-author with me on Necessary Noise, of which you want to get right away for all of your friends. He's also the president of Americans for Limited Government. And thank you for being thank with you. us, Richard. And Richard. then Dr. Allen, my biggest rebel, uh, my mentor, uh, who runs uh, Urban Cure now, Dr. William Allen. Thank you thank again. You, Star. OK, the chief operating officer here at Urban Cure. And I'm glad that you're all here, and I'm glad that um, uh, our audience is of like mind to say, what mm. is going on? We need yeah. to get into the differences between socialism and capitalism. And uh, Mike, you shared with us a little bit about your story, having spent the first 12 years in Cuba. And people use Cuba often as an example of what not to do. But it seems in our country, our youth are buying this idea that collectivism is good, that we're that there's so many disparities that we should be concerned. What are your thoughts about what our economic system should look like, especially now with such great news that things are growing again. Well, I don't even call it capitalism. Capitalism is really a, a term of the left. I call it freedom. Ooh. Free markets I own. I have right. a, 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 a pro private property. You want to buy it. We agree on a price. We walk. We both walk away happy. We're both adults. Uh, this is my property because I have put my labor into it, and I own the, 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 the sweat of my brow. Uh, but I would actually say that Cuba is not the example of things not to do according to uh, the left these days. For example, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the founder uh, of the New York Times uh, 1619 project, right. said in an interview last year that uh, the, 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 the one other country that was uh, biracial like America, the reason why it's, it has such uh, racial um, uh, happiness is because it's socialist, and she said mm. Cuba. Mm. And that is a completely untrue. Mm. We have a situation in Cuba, for example, where one white family has ruled the country, a country that is largely not white anymore, you know, for mm -hmm. 60 years. So I, I think that to many, mm -hmm. and to, of course, to a lot of people on the far left, Cuba and Venezuela are huge successes. I don't know how they determine yeah. success. No, it, it's, it's incredible, <laughs> but, but it's fascinating that you would say that even the term capitalism is a term of the left. Richard, I've not heard that before. In fact, I have my books. I brought a lot of my little books about capitalism. Here's Steve Forbes, How Capitalism Will Save Us. And we know that uh, Steve Moore, well, Moore Mark, just wrote another yeah. one on capitalism. Well, Mike is right, because <laughs> Mar Karl Marx is the one who termed that term, mm. coined that term. So it's a he, he's right, because it is freedom. It's about free enterprise. It's about the ability to exchange ideas and have a uh, and have a mutual agreement on whether to have a deal or not have a deal. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, when you get down to it, the, the key element of, of capitalism, as, they, as Karl Marx called it, is that you and I can make any decision we want to make in terms of our relationship, in terms of finances, <laughs> and, and nobody's compelling us. The government isn't compelling us to do something. Right. And socialism is the government compels everything. Right. And so in the purest forms, the, what we call capitalism is in total individual freedom to live your life, take your own risks, and have the rewards of those risks, or the downside of those risks right. born to yourself, yeah. whereas socialism is simply the government it's going to cover everything, and you you have no responsibility, but you all have you also have no capacity to control your own labor, so you become a slave. Yeah, you do become a slave, Dr. Allen. I, I kind of like the term capitalism, and I like the way that uh, Marx, I suppose, defined it, because we are talking about an economic system of freedom, if you will, to where one would own their labor, and the person who is trying to hire that labor has an opportunity to offer something in exchange. Yes. What are your thoughts about what we see going on right now, this struggle between what kind of economic system should rule in America? Well, let me start by saying I think Mike Gonzalez is right. Mm -hmm. I think that capitalism is actually not a system, per se. Mm -hmm. It's a consequence of a political structure, mm -hmm. and that's the structure of freedom. Okay. There's only really one economic system in all of human history. Mm -hmm. And that's the system of exchange, yeah. the free market. Right. But it can be more or less restricted. Right. When it's mostly restricted, it becomes totalitarian, socialist, communist. When it's least restricted, it's free. There's always some measure of restriction, even if you just have a common currency. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what are the limits of the restriction? Mm -hmm. And so what is called socialism or communism today is the 
utter limits, the utmost limits of restriction on free exchange. Mm -hmm. What's called capitalism are the, are the least restrictive conditions mm -hmm. on free exchange. So when we look at the present situation, the debate is more or less governmental control. Right. That's okay. what really is at stake. Okay, and then those government controls are in every area, distribution yes. and production, because they keep bringing up this question of inequality and, and, and how the system is not fair under a capitalism and or even a free market. So, um, so Mike, you, your book, The Plot to Change America, you talk about identity politics. A lot of this is rooted in ethnic terms and, and, and conditions, because some might have something somebody else doesn't have, and so people want to take it from them. And so I think that might be where we need more discussion about not just the <laughs> downside of socialism as an economic system, but why it's okay that some have more than others. Well, I mean, before getting into my book, some, some have more than others, because as Madison said, we have a diversity in faculties. Mm -hmm. And because we have a, divers, a diversity in faculties, we're going to have a diversity in, 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 in property. But going back to my book, I talk a lot about uh, uh, Gramsci and Marcuse, and this is very key to what is happening today. Um, they discovered that the worker was not going to be the locus of rebellion, because mm -hmm. the worker could change his condition individually. Mm -hmm. The worker mm -hmm. could be could become wealthier. But then they, they, they discovered that mm -hmm. if you go back to dividing society into immutable traits, for example, uh, race or, or national origin, ethnicity mm -hmm. or sex, these are things that you cannot change, right? Mm -hmm. I either my my parents and I were born in Cuba or Spain mm -hmm. or not. That is right. that, that right. so if you change it to that and, and and then instill resentment and victimhood into groups, into the members of groups that they create. Right. For example, Hispanic is an artificial category created yeah. by the government. Yeah. Asians yeah. another so they yeah. create these these these, these collectivities, mm -hmm. then they go about instilling resentment into its members. Saying you cannot change you cannot don't you cannot change society individually, but through the collective you can change society. And don't think about thriving individually because even if you do, that's not going to change society. Right, right. What we want is change in society. Right. We yeah. hear that a lot now, Dr. Allen. We, we were hearing that not just in the Latino communities, but we hear that a lot in black communities. That individualism is 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 white privilege. It's something that we should be dismissive of because yeah. if we're not collecting together, uh, as if there is some type of real collective common culture within someone just because they have melanin in their skin or they have a certain heritage, yeah. then we've sold out. But yet, individualism is what God did. Well, individualism, of course, is free of envy when properly developed. Mm. And, and what's being described is the imposition of envy as the basis of social relationships. Mm. So, so if you divide people into groups and if you propagate a single theory, mm -hmm. whoever has more than another stole it. Mm. Whoever has less has had it stolen from him. Mm -hmm. Then you drive the theory of envy. And that's the politics we're living through. It that's is. the ideology we are struggling with. Yeah, the, uh, the politics of envy. And, and Richard, I think that, uh, as you pointed out many times just in our own conversations, that a lot of this was inculcated through our schools, our public schools. This right. is where now we have two generations. Where did we m miss it to say, we kind of like that God made us individual and unique. I mean, you can't help but that your family came from right. wherever they did, and you have hair of, of I, I'm, I'm, I am anti-melon. You're anti-melon. <laughs> yeah, and uh, exactly. as a result, I don't even get a tan. No, I, I, all, I get, oh, I get, all I get man. is burnt. All I get is burnt. Well, you but it's, a, but it's okay. Oh, I, man, you're discriminated from, against. As, as, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 I, and I've grown up as a ginger, although they didn't have that descriptive term back oh. when I was a kid. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was the lone Redheaded kid boy mm -hmm. in the in the classroom and uh, redhead little redhead girls are cute as we learned from Charlie Brown but redheaded boys not so much so <laughs> it's a uh, so but having said having said that the uh, you know by golly they ought to be in a perfect program have, for yes, you I, I, I know <laughs> I know but but you know what the bottom line on it is we all have our own differences we all have our own our own things that make us unique right. and we either celebrate the things that we make us unique right. or we fail to right. and what they what they've told our kids is that you you know your uniqueness is less important than the victimhood of somebody else in the classroom. Mm -hmm. The fact that you live in a house, a nicer neighborhood, makes you, you should be feel less than the person who doesn't get the, that same neighborhood experience. Mm -hmm. And because of that, 
um, there's a they create a natural uh, guilt of anybody who has more. Mm -hmm. um, and quite honestly, um, if you have more in terms of an ability to be good at school, Mm -hmm. um, you are essentially told that you should you should dumb it down. Well, some places, because didn't we just see out of Harvard where the, the Asian students said, no, 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 oh, we can't yeah. help it that we do better on the SAT or the right. test, yeah. so, and they went to the Supreme Court. So, Dr. Allen, you had a point that you wanted to make on his... Yeah, uh, I just think what Richard was saying is so apt, because the reality is that we have material conditions of life and we have moral conditions of life. Okay. And when we substitute the material for the moral, <laughs> we drive this discourse of distinction, difference, and envy. But remember that the important thing about an economic system, and therefore socialism, capitalism, is that they stand primarily on moral, not material grounds. Right. So the materialistic argument that you are what your material circumstances make you directly undermines the moral argument that you are as good as you can be. I, 100%. And in fact, it's so scriptural. Mike, the, I, mean, I see the, why he's a lead the, rebel. Yeah, uh, he's a lead rebel. <laughs> he's so right. I mean, the Bible even says that God distributed talents. How in the world? World, yes. Are we going to deny that part of our human nature? And especially what you just said, Richard, we can't help, well, help the set of circumstances that we were born into. But I think one of the things that you're onto, Mike, I think, in the book, because I just got my copy autographed to, uh, it's um, <laughs> that, that there's just this insistence <laughs> that we can collect together. There's this, this insistence that there's right. the cards are stacked <laughs> against you if your a lot was not similar to somebody else, that there is not a destiny regardless of what those set of circumstances were. Well, I mean, it Look, I, the, the whole thing is premised on the fact that you're a victim at birth, that you are born into a caste. So, for example, if you want to get a preferential pre uh, uh, contract in one of these set-aside contracts in the city, all you have to do is show that you are a member of the category. And even if you're a wealthy person, even if you can show that you have overcome yeah. your victimhood, right. then you, can, you still get the set-aside contract, right. no matter how wealthy or successful you are. Mm -hmm. You cannot expunge your, 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 yeah, your victimhood. You, have, I know. you know, which is <laughs> yeah. really, I, I, I hate to say I use this term, but it's a completely un-American yeah, reading of the individual. It really that is. you're born into a caste, and no matter if you show that you have overcome whatever victimhood, life throws curves at all of us. Right. And it, it, it used to be that you drew your dignity and claims for respect on how you over came, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your victimhood. Mm -hmm. But now that we have a whole system, a whole culture of victimhood, mm -hmm. there's zero incentive to sell your victimhood. Right. And of course, the promise that the ideologues hold out is nourish that resentment, feel the envy, mm -hmm. feel the, the victimhood, because only through that can you help, through the collective, overthrow America, overthrow well, the and, system of America. And I think that that's what they're really after, Dr. Allen, is the system of America, because yeah. in what Mike is saying, now you have w w this <laughs> white guilt that is, that is saying, I am so privileged that I have to give away. But it's such a, you mentioned the ideological left, not in those words, but you did talk about them, and yeah. that, you even have people like Chelsea Clinton saying, I'm just too privileged. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, why doesn't she just give it away? Well, you know, I mean, we do have people in history like St. Francis of Assisi. He was very wealthy. He just gave it away. No one's forcing you to be privileged, if that's what you call it. So I want you to speak into what Mike just identified, that now people are adopting their victimhood and celebrating that and not even trying to break free from the collective Well, mindset. I would say it in the terms of the old fable, the king, if you think the people are king, is naked. Mm. But how did the king become naked? What stripped the king? Ask how we celebrated the fall of communism. Mm -hmm. If you go back and you pay attention to the statesmanship of the era, you will see they declared we won because we were rich. For material reasons, not moral reasons. I see. So I think we better visit the moral reasons. When we come back at the second half, we have to solve the problem. So I'll be back with my panel, and we're going to talk about the moral reasons that we should get out of this mindset.
Well, there was a lot of discussion while you were away, but we're back, and I'm hoping that they remember some of the things that they were talking about. <laughs> I have Mike Gonzalez with us from the Heritage Foundation with a brand new book, The Plot to Change America. And if you have a, a, someone younger than millennial, the Z, you need to get it for them because they're changing. They're indoctrinating them. Richard, you know that yourself. Richard from Americans for Limited Government works here in Washington trying to limit the role of government. Uh, thank you for being here. It's <laughs> also Richard Manning. Why are you doing like that? Like, I, I know even with our own administration that sometimes Sometimes friendly, but sometimes need correction too. There's just something about this swamp. It is swampy. Yeah, just get in here and just kind of figure. Well, mm. I get this big old budget. Let me just kind of spend this money. But Dr. Allen, we've just heard from Little Pup. You've never bought into the establishment kind of thing. So thank you for being here with us, Dr. William Allen. Corrupt from the beginning. From the very beginning, <laughs> <laughs> it's just been an incredible. And now heading up Urban Cure. So I really appreciate it. But yeah, Richard, um, one of the things that you mentioned during the break was the equality of persons, and yeah. I was thinking about revisiting that with you because I'm saying, did he just tell us that he has no melanin and had red hair? That's right. not equality of anything right. well, with anyone else in your class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's true. The But our country was founded on a, on a simple idea, and we've perfected it over time, but it's founded on a simple idea that we're equality, we are equal as persons, that there's equal opportunity. We've had to perfect it over time, and we have done so. But modern theology of, of from Antifa and the rest is that we should have equality of outcomes, mm. and equality of outcomes based upon the, the presumption that we aren't equal as persons. And the difference is really simple. If you view everybody as equal as persons, we have to treat everybody with respect. Right. We have the idea, treat others as you would have treat, yourself be treated, has meaning. But the minute you say people are other, Right. And we have to have equality of outcomes. It's perfectly justified for somebody to go and take from their neighbor simply because they want it and they believe their neighbor has more than they, because you no longer are equal as persons. Perfect. You're able to differentiate and say, mm -hmm. I need to equal out, equalize outcomes, and as a result, they're less a person and I can take their stuff. But, and now it's changing to where people are wanting to be less a person. You know, Dr. L, I think I mentioned to you that when I flew last week, I'm in first class, and then here comes this bubbly blonde from the back of the plane with a Black Lives Matter shirt on. I'm thinking, there's just something wrong with this picture. And I thought, well, perhaps, now that we're exchanging everything, that the next time I'm in the back of the plane and she's in the front, I'm just going to come up there and ask for her seat. <laughs> but I think that we have, um, we're in a new place with some of the discussions that are going on in our society. You get a good economic report, mm -hmm. and people are dismissive. The mainstream media doesn't even pick it up. And others are saying, well, that doesn't matter, because I think what Richard's point is, that we're looking for same outcomes, and yet that's not possible, is it? No, of course it's not possible. How can you take the diverse constituent elements of humanity and turn it into a single lump of clay? Mm. Perhaps God can do that, mm. but we can't. And, therefore, and he decided not to. And he decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, it's not possible. And, and therefore the real issue is, how are we going to live through this strange discourse in which people say things that have nothing to do with reality? Right. They, they have goals, projects, initiatives, and ambitions. Yeah. But they aren't really thought through. No, and they're very loud. And they're demanding. Yes. Now they're saying, we demand. Did yes. you see that? Now we demand. This is right. not America. Right, right. I don't even know if that's what happened in Cuba. Or was it just a few? Because now we have marchers in the street, peaceful protesters, saying, we demand. Right. And yet we have elections coming up very soon. Well, this is, a, uh, this is a very good experiment from a, a, few, a couple of years ago by the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania that discovered that you can you don't have to convince 100% of society. Right. You, ha you just have to convince 25% or even less, and if they're determined and active, they can then change all norms in society. Uh, so look, I think that this, is, this issue of the individual is one of the main things. I disagree with you, Dr. Allen, one thing. You know what Reagan said about liberals? It's not that they don't know anything, it's that they know bad things, that they know <laughs> wrong things. I think these people are, have been indoctrinated, mm -hmm. but they have been indoctrinated into a really, I would say, evil ideology. You know, mm -hmm. our system, as be, from before, from the Enlightenment, in fact, all the way back to the Bible, is based on the individual, mm -hmm. individual salvation. Uh, Locke speaks of the individual, the, the, the individual has rights, the, the God gives the individual natural rights. They don't speak of the individual. Their agent is the member of the group. Right. 
the member of the group is now the actor in society. The group is the actor, and you're only a <laughs> member in it. And in fact, all the way from Gramsci, uh, we can talk a lot about this, but I know the time is limited. They say, we know that you can change your lot in life through individual action, that you can improve, that you, but that's not what we want. That's not what they want. We don't want you to become better. We don't want, so they don't want you to become a wealthier person, a more successful person. They want to change the country. They plot to change America. I yeah. called it that for a reason. Yeah. And they want the group to change, or the different groups, to change America. Well, but I think it's a little hypocritical, though, because the funding is coming from very wealthy people. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I think that they, it's worked for them a little. Right. Yeah. right. Can, can, I, can I comment on something that Mike said? Because I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. The idea that 25% of the people can change the society, mm -hmm. that works in the opposite direction also. Mm -hmm. It means the 25% of us can change yeah, society. society. And I would point out that there was this guy who walked around about 2,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and he had 12. Right. Okay, and one of them wasn't that great. Right. And so uh, <laughs> and, and, he, and he came around, and he, he managed to change the world. And he's the single most influential person in the history of the world yeah. because he was a man god. Yeah. But the fact is, God uses small movements, small right. numbers of people to move mass movements. Right. And so when you think about the 25% that, mm -hmm. that might be out there on the wrong side, mm -hmm. remember, 75% on the right side, right. and the question is, are you going to be silent? Are you are you going to well, make, make necessary noise? Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> noise. Well, I think the noise is so necessary now, as we pointed out in the book, without people being involved. I mean, this is because I don't know that I agree that there's 75 percent. There might be 10 percent that are like the activists mm -hmm. to say we got to make sure that we protect the interests of our society and our common culture. But Dr. Allen, what? How do we turn it around? What should we be thinking about to uh, make it a 75? I think I don't know. Most of them will I'll go take, either way. I'll take 60. <laughs> You'll take 60. Well, I don't know. I, I'm not <laughs> going to encourage either of you. Is that what you think they can send their kids to those I, public schools? I want to encourage either of you to be, think you're going to succeed aiming for 60 and 75. How many do we in every, in every culture, you have a plurality. That's the largest group. Not less than a majority, but okay. a plurality. Okay. And you have a significant minority. And then you have fragments, which oh. float between the two. And these are what the social scientists call marginal voters. Okay. And it's actually the marginal voters who decide the outcome mm. as they move back and forth. Yeah. So what you're going to do is try to attract those marginal, marginal. voters to your side, right. whether you're the plurality or the minority, okay. in order to achieve a majority in the vote. Because the majority of the vote is not the equivalent of a majority in opinion. Well, this is a dynamic of a political process, right. whereas opinion is a cultural and social process. But, yes, it is. So <laughs> Christ, yes, drove a cultural and social process. And we can also seek to imitate Christ. Right. But we mustn't confuse that with electoral politics. Right. And I think that why that's important for, uh, for me, Mike, is that although, <laughs> yes, as Christians, we will survive. And we know what persecution looks like all around the world yes. if we have to go in there arena here uh, on this side of eternity for this yes. limited time, then we will survive that. But that's not what the founding was about. This is this, The public square is at stake. And I think that in that vote, we do get a choice to say, are we going to have a public square that is open to... Uh -oh, do you Dr. mind if Thomas? I just cut you off for a second? Mm -hmm. I think that is what the founding was about. Mm -hmm. The founding was to give the opportunity to the good to provide direction in society. Okay. And in every generation, it's the duty of the good to respond to that invitation. That's what freedom is about. So then what happened? Did we get just complacent in that in the yes. last generation? Because oh. I agree, but, it, and it's been a struggle, as you pointed out, Richard, that we're moving toward that perfect union. Boy, because it's, well, it's really hard. Sorry, I'm right going to answer it really quickly, and that is our leaders have decided that they're not going to define, defend the underlying philosophy behind what they're trying to do. Yeah. You know, you could say, I'm going to cut taxes, but unless you're saying, because it's their money and not our money, right. you know, in terms of the government, God. you haven't defined the underlying question. So why we when you, when we you, and, and when you go away from saying, we need to, pay, to charge one flat tax of everybody, because that's actually fair, yeah. 10, 15 percent, whatever it is. Well, 10, I, God, I, no, okay. 9, because okay. well, nine, 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 God I, only I wanted I, 10, I, I so it. we have to nine, do less. Nine, 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 nine. Yeah. Uh -huh. I got it. But I just, but, you are but right the, about But the point that. is, because we accept the progressive tax system, mm -hmm. we accept the underlying philosophy of Marxism. You're right. That from those who have, have some must go to those who need. Right. We under, in our 100 years of acceptance of that since 1913 when we did the tax code. So You know, you're describing why I actually want to personalize Social Security. I, I You know, the system in itself is flawed, and we know that, um, actually, according to the Supreme Court, it's not even legal. <laughs> 
people were mm -hmm. his own business. But because of Scripture, because you're absolutely right. It says a good man leaves an inheritance to their grandchildren, and the wealth of the wicked's laid up for the just. Well, how do you do that? If the only little bit you have, you're forced to put it into this dark hole. So I agree with you, Richard, that um, if, if our political leaders would get a little courage to define why they do believe what they do and what is driving a particular philosophy, uh, we might see a little bit more of that yes. middle come and say, OK, I like that. But so, Mike, where are we going from here? Well, uh, first of all, on the, on the flat tax, I happen to have lived in a place that had to have a flat tax, Hong Kong a completely uh, prosperous place. It's now being ruined by the Chinese Communist Party mm -hmm. because the communists ruined everything. Oh, yeah. But but it, it did have a flat tax. For They're exactly, still trying to fight, though, aren't they? They are. They are. Oh, but, but for sorry. exactly the reasons uh, that you mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, uh, Richard, uh, look, mm -hmm. I think it's going to— What was to, their tax, though? Do you remember? I, I, I forget what it was, but, but, you, it was but, but you paid nothing until you got to a certain level, and then everybody paid then that. Then everybody pays the same. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but, look, I, I think it's going to be—we we cannot blind ourselves to the fact that we have lost the commanding heights of the culture. Mm -hmm. The reason why there are no riots in Portland, apparently, is because the media refuses to tell the rest of the country that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why people have accepted, you know, the, the, the certain, uh, you know, degrees of depravity is because Hollywood sells it, and they watch it on TV every night. Uh, we have also, in, in a huge, humongous way, we lost the Academy. The Academy is just this, the, the, a monopoly of the, the left or the hard left. Mm -hmm. And we're now about to lose corporate America. Oh, that, that's, that's the next battle, the, 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 the C-suite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we, I believe, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist because communism tries to do an impossible thing, change human nature. Yeah. Human nature is unchangeable. We read the Bible. We read the, uh, the, uh, the Iliad. We see Agamemnon and Sarah and Abraham and Moses, people that are just like us. Yeah. Human nature doesn't change. Yeah. Communism thinks it can change human nature, mm -hmm. and when it fails, and it fails miserably, the new man never shows up, it has to rely on coercion. We have all these truths on our side, but as long as we don't have the commanding rights of, of the culture, mm -hmm. how are we going to be able to get this? This is very good that you're doing this. This is incredible because you're right about what we're accepting. We're just like slowly going into, we don't need coercion. You right. know, just watch TV. In fact, during COVID, I was watching TV. I don't watch TV, but COVID, I'm sitting there doing nothing else. I'm like, I was shocked by what people think is funny. Huh, I don't it's yeah. interesting what <laughs> I was it's, like, wait, this I mean, is interesting what people yeah. are laughing about. So where are the 75%? Where are the Christians? Are they watching this stuff thinking it's funny and watching their country slip away and think that everything will just fare well for their grandchildren if they let them just go march with BLM? They're looking for leaders mm. because, you know, the job of, of leaders is to, is is to provide the beacon that they can follow. Not everybody has to be a, an intellectual who's figuring out the deep, the deep thoughts, mm -hmm. but the fact is that freedom rings naturally in all of our souls. Mm -hmm. And That's why uh, unfortunately, Kong, our, the leaders who have who've emerged yeah. have accepted the premise of the left, and as a result, they aren't able to lead against the left. So, and I'm not well, knocking any political leaders. I'm just yeah. saying that people like, the leaders never come, rarely come, right. Right. from the people who are the so-called elites. The leaders come from the people, and they stand up, and they, and they begin to, and they touch a resonant chord. Yeah. And so I believe our leaders are standing in church pulpits. Yeah. I believe our leaders are, are, are the people standing up in college and saying, no, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who are hardened against the left and will lead our country moving forward. And I we've got to just hold the ramparts until they get here. I, I agree to a, an extent, but I also believe that we do elect officials that, and they should lead. They oh, need I, to have I, the yeah, courage they, to do what they, they should ask yeah, to do. Not, and in particular, those that say that they came here to change not, Washington, they need to get to work. Yep. Um, I, I don't know. Doctor, do you got 20 seconds? Did you have a final thought? Are we going to be able to I don't kind think of, the politicians uh, are in charge. I think those heights of the culture are in charge, and I don't think we're going to defeat them by waiting for a leader. We're going to defeat them by ejecting them. Oh, oh well, <laughs> we have that opportunity coming up in November. <laughs> that is one thing beautiful about the country. We have elections. Didn't Garfield tell us that? I'll be right back. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, 
I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now to give you deep discounts, not just on my pillows, but also my mattress topper sheets and so much more. For example, you can get body pillows regularly $89.99, only $29.99 with your promo code. With our 60 day money back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Sleep well, America! For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit mypillow.com. Well, I hope my panel gave you some new things to think about. Uh, these are some really hot topics, important topics, and we, we're all over these topics, so I'm glad uh, that we were able to discuss that with you. Now I have a wrap-up with a friend who's becoming a friend, Brandon Showalter. He's a journalist, and he's at the uh, Christian Post. The reason I keep having him come back to share with us, welcome, and thank you for thank coming you, back to share with us, is because the Christian Post is becoming a very dear friend of ours uh, here at Urban Cure. And so I want to, um, this time, introduce you more than the, just that Brandon is a reporter. I want to tell you a little bit about him because he reports on a wide range of theological, political, and ethical themes and topics. So you might want to follow him because now we're starting to see some changes in culture that would matter most to those that are going to church. Uh, and he writes about these things. Uh, Brandon first uh, was first inspired to break into career in writing and journalism while he was mopping floors and scrubbing toilets at a church uh, in, as a custodian there in April. 2015. He's a young man, earned a BA degree from Bridgewater College of Virginia, is a fellow of the John Jay Institute for Faith, Society, and Law, and graduated from a three-year program at Bethel School of Ministry in Redding, California. His most favorite thing to do in life is to sing. It's true. You can sing? I didn't even get to sing. I don't know how to sing, but I'm going to learn when I get to heaven. I'm All right. If God lets me into heaven. Make a joyful noise. I'll make a, oh, I do do that now. Mm -hmm. I will try to sing, but I just don't know how. But welcome and thank you. Thank and you. one of these shows, I'll have you actually do a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> we might have you. Well, maybe. We'll see. We'll, we'll see. see as we grow and everybody says, yeah, we want to hear All right. If I get letters that say they want to hear you sing. Okay. But in the meantime, uh, you know, we, we're excited to some degree, at least I am, uh, that we had some good economic news. So we here in Washington, D.C. are starting to say, good, maybe there's not going to be momentum for that next stimulus after all because the resilience of the American people. But you've expressed to me that you've been a little concerned about how morally we're falling apart. And so there might not be the same type of um, attitude in people to say, let's get up and be individuals as there may have been 20, 30 years ago. Elaborate a little bit about what you're seeing as a journalist. Well, I think that when, when we think of capitalism, um, you know, I'm certainly a supporter of free enterprise, small business. Both my parents are small business people. And if we want to have a thriving economy, it has to be practiced alongside good ethics. Right. And I think it behooves us as Christians to contend for what's good and right, particularly when it comes to how we do business. I know what's been one of the in interesting things that I've explored even as a reporter is how when people talk about capitalism a lot of church going people think of it in small business entrepreneurial terms things that are good things that are fine mm -hmm. there's sort of the other side I hate to think of it's not just a left right division it's more complicated mm -hmm. than that but people are thinking about really predatory business practices right, right, we as right. Christians well, not corporations think, it's kind well, of oh, yeah, or even, there is no and honor. some things should never yeah. be for sale the yeah. human body should never be for sale mm -hmm. I would like to see this business of the fertility industry, like women selling their eggs for money, shut right. that down. Right. It's, right. it's not right. We so don't just profit. defend the almighty dollar at all costs because it might provide a living mm. for somebody. Some things are just wrong. Right. And if we don't have a grid of what, you know, a, an understanding of the material and what 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 our bodies mean? What what does it mean to be human? If we don't have a robust understanding of that, that's going to influence everything: right. how we do business, how we right. engage in commerce, how we interact with the community, mm -hmm. how we give to charity that's actually helpful and not philanthropy that's just 
allowing like, fabulously wealthy people to throw their money around. These things really matter, and it, yeah. it affects everything. Now, are you finding in your reporting, and as you're out there and about talking to people about the different stories in their lives, that uh, there's a majority of people now that just don't have that moral compass to be able to decide? I mean, there's so much depression going on uh, right now. Even when people lose their business, there's just a sense of everything is lost. Everything is about materialism as opposed to that moral thread that you seem to be talking about. There, there has definitely been a breakdown. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that, um, and many reasons for that, many contributing factors for that. Um, I do think that people are hungering to see uh, a renewed sense of of, of, of ethics. Mm -hmm. People, it, people care about it. People. There is a, I mean, these sort of far left social justice warriors that are, I think, just drunk on some Kool Aid. <laughs> there, 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 there's people that are just so blind to, they, they don't, there's no kind of any sensible moral core there. But there is an impulse mm -hmm. that there have been some injustices in the, in the past. So there is a hunger out there mm -hmm. for, for real justice. So you think that some be, might be looking for looking some for truth. It. And so it's a time for the truth tellers to rise up. To, to rise up Absolutely. To get, yeah, we had a little bit of discussion with the panel that said maybe, that we're, maybe we focus too much on looking for the politician to lead us out of oh, this. Absolutely. So perhaps there's a role of the church and church people. It, it really does. And I think it's, um, I think especially as Christian businessmen and mm -hmm. women practice kingdom generosity, okay. as they are actively caring about the community, establishing that kind of, uh, now these riots are a different story. I know right, right, people right, are just right. going, but, but like as, 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 just, as, as, just as a witness. Like taking care of people. It really, I mean, the businessmen, I think, it just again, coming from a small business family, mm -hmm. they want to help, right, like right. a lot of these social ills that are happening there, and right. they're often forgotten. Well, and that's and the it, thing and about it, a cause. If you to, have a cause, you should you you support your cause. You right. grab a cause and you support that cause. But what we're seeing of late is people wanting to force others into their cause. Right. You know, you're right. That's Police unhealthy. brutality is a cause. Social injustice, if they one. want to right. call it, is a cause which is loosely defined, but that might not be others' cause. Some cause is adoption. Some cause is, um, is, is homelessness. We all have some, some are pro-life. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm very mm -hmm. much uh, involved in making sure that the offspring are being right, able to birth and contribute to our society. So I agree with you there. So I'm wondering now, because of the upset in the mm -hmm. economy, um, are more people thinking about the morality in their lives so that we can prosper uh, when things come back economically? I think that this pandemic and all of the things that have in the riots then too has has really been I believe it's a divine reset. Mm. I believe God has used this. I mean I don't believe he sponsored any of it, but that what can be shaken is being shaken. Yeah it is. And it and it's shaking people down to the very core to causing people to reevaluate what they think about a lot of things. We'll see the fruit of this for the next few years, possibly as long as a decade. I think this mm -hmm. is definitely a pivot point in our history mm -hmm. where people are really reevaluating what do I think and what do I believe because our mm -hmm. sense of normalcy has been shattered. Mm -hmm. It's as but hard as it is to see people too, be as hard as it is for people to see to mm -hmm. lose their business and to lose everything. Mm -hmm. This can be I don't celebrate any destruction, but this can be a good thing for people to really get, go deep. I think it is, and I think deep. that that's what we saw, at least what I saw, but some of these economic numbers and right. the labor... Uh, it's good Bureau, to see it coming back. It's, it's good, good to see it coming back, but that means individuals are bringing it back. And I think that, Absolutely. to your point, that once folks get a hold of themselves again and, and readjust ourselves, it's one of the beauties of America. Well, and small yeah. business is the backbone well, of our economy. Really and is, I think so there, you've back. never met determined people like small business people. And that's why I know they'll be yeah. fine. People yeah. Well, I mean, my business was destroyed during the 1992 Los right. Angeles riots. And while nobody wants to go through destruction, no. no one wants to go through bankruptcy, but there is life after that you become a better person. And people that have the uh, the, what, the entrepreneurial gut Absolutely. to begin with, they're going to be just fine. They just find something else to do. So I want to thank you for this. Oh, thank, thank you, you, Brandon. Thank you. I'll, I'll be right back. I have some final thoughts after this very important message. Today, a student in public school will pray or lead a Bible study. Today, a pastor will preach boldly the truth of the scriptures without fear of the IRS. Today, the life of an innocent child will be saved, and a mother will experience the joy of a newborn baby. A distraught woman will find hope and choose life rather than death. Today, there is a strong voice defending God's created natural order of marriage and family. There is a defender of freedom in the courtroom and in the halls of Congress and in legislative bodies across the land. Today, all of this is possible because of the Ministry of Liberty Council. 
People from all over America will find help and hope because of Liberty Council. The adversity they face will be turned into victory. Case by case, law by law, person by person, Liberty Council is advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family through litigation, education, and public policy. And that is the mission of Liberty Council, to restore the culture by advancing life, liberty, and family. discussion this week. I hope that you have taken a lot from it, that you'll think about it. I think we even have some names to look up uh, for Mike Gonzalez, our special guest, uh, because those who want to transform our nation from a free nation driven through, forward by capitalism to become a socialist nation uh, run by politicians, they see our current times of stress and uncertainty as opportunity. But then enter God with the incredible Bureau of Labor Statistics Economic Recovery Report. It's like we've been given a touch of optimistic serendipity, a miracle intervention from the heavens to point out our resilience, the resilience of individualism. Yep, just at a moment when here in Washington they were looking for ways to spend another $3 trillion on all types of pet projects and political programs, the economic data came forth that Americans are getting back to work in record numbers. Another $3 trillion spending bill laced with more subsidies for unemployment benefit and industry bailouts would have been an obstacle, not an aid, to the recovery that we're now seeing. But due to D.C. gridlock, Nothing could get passed, <laughs> yet simultaneously, we as a people were building up enough faith and fortitude to take initiative into our own hands and bounce back. And we did. So now, given the uniform record of success from capitalism and the uniform record of failure from socialism, it defies logic that so many of our youth are demanding an overhaul and replacement of our current economic system. So this is our big next work to reach them with truth about money. You know, the preacher of Ecclesiastics said in 519 that when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. Listen, crises occur all the time. The unforeseen and the unpredictable are part of the way the world is. And some of these parts we cannot change. The way to deal with this inevitability is to keep things free and to let unique individuals take personal responsibility for their own lives. This is the best way to adjust, to innovate, and to recover from any circumstance, economic or otherwise. But layering our economy with more government, that's a way to stifle growth. You know, over the years in my weekly syndicated column, I have periodically reminded my readers about the various indexes that measure economic freedom. They uniformly show that economically free countries grow and prosper, and economically unfree countries don't. Yes, of course, we as a nation are in a season of just turmoil and challenge that's causing a lot of individual stress and despair. But please, let's not allow ourselves to get seduced into the delusions of socialism. Economies work when the individuals in it are free to innovate, free to initiate, free to create, to work, to organize their own lives. It's so seductive for some to believe that government can lead the way out, that collectivism can do your life for you. It's not true, not true now, and never has been true. So let's celebrate this great economic news. That's what I want to do. And let's use it to shore up our convictions to maintain a free and thriving nation under God. That's it for this week here on Cure America with Star Parker. Visit our website at urbancure.org. You'll get all of our shows. You can share them with your friends. And we would appreciate your helping us continue this program. Thank you and see you again next week.